En tanto, yo les voy a presentar brevemente a nuestra ponente de hoy. Eh, nuestra invitada tiene una trayectoria investigativa extensa, creativa, con un trabajo eh, intelectualmente muy riguroso, y quizás eh, lo que más admiro de ella es la forma en la que va tramando complejos compromisos éticos eh, en lo que investiga y cómo eso también es una fuerza de, de, de descubrimiento. ¿no? Justina es profesora asociada de literatura y directora del Center for Young People's Literature and Culture en el Instituto de Estudios Ingleses de la Universidad de Breslavia, Wrocław, Polonia. Eh, también es fundadora del Centro de Investigación en Literatura Infantil y Juvenil que depende de la Facultad de Letras de esa misma universidad. Es autora de la monografía, además de muchísimos artículos, pero es autora de la monografía Yes to Solidarity, No to Oppression, Radical Fantasy Fiction and Its Young Readers, publicada en el 2016. Y recientemente ha coeditado tres distintos tomos en los que participan distintas investigadoras e investigadores de nuestro campo. Rules of Literary Playgrounds, Politics of Intergenerational Play in Children's Literature, editado con Bárbara Cala, el 2021, Intergenerational Solidarity in Children's Literature and Film, with Zoe Jax, también ese año, y Children's Literature and Intergenerational Relationships, Encounters of the Playful Kind, también con Bárbara Cala. Entre el 17 y el 21, ella fue también parte del directorio de la Sociedad Internacional para la Investigación en Literatura Infantil y Juvenil, eh, que la conocemos por sus siglas en inglés, IRSCL, IRCL. Sus intereses de investigación incluyen la participación de niñas en los campos sociales, políticos y culturales, el poshumanismo y más recientemente la investigación con agencias y actores más que humanos, que es de lo que nos viene a hablar o a especular hoy. Eh, bajo el título de su charla. The, the name of literature um, towards more than human participatory research. Thank you, Cristina. Justina, for being with us. Thank you very much, Macarena um, uh, and, and, and colleagues. Uh, thank you very much for your invitation and for this wonderful opportunity um, uh, to share my work and ideas. Um, let me just share my screen uh, just to get it right. Mm -hmm. So I hope it, you can see it. Is that right? Okay, thank you. So once again, thank you very much. And I'm especially grateful uh, for this opportunity at this time when our thoughts are preoccupied with um, ever more fearsome uh, realities uh, of the Russian aggression against uh, Ukraine. And I hope you don't mind uh, my making the connection between this sadly ongoing tragedy and the focus of my talk participatory uh, research with more than um, humans in children's literature and culture studies. And perhaps um, uh, you have noticed um, the massive public recognition of how the war is affecting animals. And maybe you have heard of Ukrainians walking with or carrying their dogs, cats and other animals to the border in the refusal to leave them behind. There has also been um, grassroots mobilization uh, of various local and international NGOs and private initiatives to transport animals to Poland and elsewhere or to deliver food and medical help to animals in Ukraine. And sadly, there have also uh, been reports of deaths of animals, of starvation, of fires, of military activities, animals dying um, beside their owners. That all of this has been claiming so much international attention is a tangible sign of a special sensibility, a sense of commitment to and love for what Donna Haraway would call our multi-species kin, kin that we have invited into our lives. And I'm wondering uh, whether this means that animals in such beautiful books as uh, Migrants uh, or The Suitcase will be read not as proxies for human refugees, but as representations of animal refugees. And maybe this massive attention given to the suffering of animals also means that the Russian invaders or any other aggressors elsewhere will be held responsible before the International Criminal Court uh, for the genocide of more than humans, animals, plants, the land, the sea, air, climate, so for violence done to ecosystems, just as we hold them responsible for the atrocities they have committed against humans. 
trying to address all this within my own context of a children's literature and culture scholar, I would like to share some thoughts about creating openings for such kinshipping sensibilities and for welcoming more than humans in participatory uh, research with children and texts of culture. More than human participatory research is done with rather than on uh, non-humans, and it is based on methods that invite them to participate actively in the research process. It's about living with more than humans and learning with them instead of being artificially separated from them and approaching them as objects uh, for the production of knowledge. As uh, Texin Durani and Julian Brickstock point out, it's a research paradigm that is applicable to almost anything because it insists that human uh, social worlds are always more than human social worlds. That is, they are composed of relations between humans, non-human life and non-human forces. And this approach has a solid background, for example, in material ecocriticism, critical animal and plant studies, uh, multi-species ethnography, studies of plant uh, intelligence, uh, student uh, studies of animal behavior and emotions, and of course, in indigenous knologies, in which modern human um, eco ontologies have always been of fundamental importance. The very number of these diverse fields indicates uh, how much we have yet to learn about our planet, and we can only hope that we still have time for it and for the implementation of this new knowledge. More than human participatory research is not widespread. There are still very few publications, scholarly publications uh, on the topic. Uh, in the slide, you, you can see the two main publications that I have managed to found. Uh, it obviously uh, poses uh, serious challenges, some of which I will address. However, I have come across very interesting examples of research that could be seen as more than human and participatory in early childhood education. And I will refer to one such example uh, later. Now, what has been uh, my own pathway towards an interest in this approach? And I apologize for this lengthy introduction, but I think it's necessary to provide the broader context for a proposition that I'm sure may seem unfeasible and controversial. Firstly, uh, participatory research with children and texts has for a long time constituted an important form of my engagement um, with children's literature studies, as my attempt to question the default acceptance of an um, heteronormativity in our field. Heteronormativity is the assumption that adults and adult experiences are normative, while children and their experiences are deviant um, uh, from the norm or deficit. There has been, of course, a larger movement in our field to acknowledge um, other child-adult uh, relations, and of course, um, Amara Guba's work is most prominent here. And my proposition has been to see how this kind of thinking translates into research um, that would open possibilities for intergenerational understandings. Participatory research with children as partners co-creating the research process subverts dominant age and professional power structures and counteracts the marginalization of children, well, children's worldviews, knowledges and experiences as children become co-producers of knowledge. Hence, it opens our field epistemologically by democratizing and um, uh, diversifying knowledge production. This practice recognizes that young people may have different ideas and experiences from adults and are thus the best informants on their own lives. Children as co-researchers and co-experts produce in situ observations that can be combined with and shape adults' perspectives, producing a nuanced and comprehensive understanding of the object of study. And you can read more about my projects and um, the projects that I co-conducted with children in several articles, uh, including uh, two peer-reviewed articles co-authored with child researchers. Secondly, uh, more recently, thanks to my collaboration with Macarena, I have become interested in post-human ontoethical epistemologies and their potential uh, to unhinge the privileged position of the human adult and the human child, as well as of book culture, uh, for the sake of exploring child-adult child connectivities as created and shaped by human and more than human relationalities. As we argue in our joint article, uh, from the post-anthropocentric perspective, children's literature and culture, which for us includes text produced by children, is a material expression that itself produces relationships, and its meaning is produced through human and non-human interactions. The discursive, effective, and material layers of texts both generate and are transformed by relationalities involving readers' experiences and the physical world around them. 
audiences respond uh, both to text linguistic meanings and to their sounds, textures, shapes, or colors through their entanglements with the world. If viewed as such, children's culture may become a vital space for children and adults to respond to material conditions of everyday life with care, compassion, and respect for life and matter around us. Such an approach also necessitates methods geared not so much towards producing new knowledge, but towards immersing oneself into events and processes emerging in messy post-human entanglements, and towards registering these assemblages of bodies, texts, effects, and the materialities of research itself in their singularity and fluidity without attempting to tidy them up. To do justice to these processes, methods cannot be fully planned. They need to emerge in the research encounter. Following, for example, the work of Stephanie Springay and Sarah E. Truman, we believe that it's worth looking at our methods, not as predetermined processes aimed at collecting data, but as always of being inside the research events, entangling us in relations with, rather than positioning us as superior to and separate from what we research. Uh, so we also uh, look at methods as enabling us to do something other than extracting data from text and interpreting it, something that involves thinking, making, doing uh, such research, as uh, Springer and Truman uh, point out, is about inventive practices, as, this, as, as they say, uh, that intervene, disturb, intensify, or provoke heightened sense of the potentiality of the present to welcome and follow emergent relations. All this has led me to wonder about how knowledge production in children's literature and culture studies could be enriched uh, by opening it, opening it not only to children, but also to more than human knowers and other agencies and voices. So if children and adults uh, may be key actors with expert knowledge, perhaps the status could be extended to more than humans, which of course makes us ask uh, new how knowledge is produced, by whom, for whom, for what interests and for what purposes. Could our field offer practices for what Natasha Meyers refers to as cultivating, I'm quoting, modes of attention that might help us tune in to the complexity of life worlds, which are already shaped by various human and more than human actors? Perhaps for this kind of scholarship, our field could be pushed even more towards post-humanism and the post-anthropocene. Could this kind of research make us aware of how we need to create conditions for the emergence of connections, intersections, and disjunctions with the life on the planet and with the modern humans who have their own stories to tell, uh, written, as Chantaine puts it beautifully in one of his tales from the inner city, on the tail fins of fresh, uh, freshwater trout under the bark of trees, in the creased silt of riverbeds, on the wing scale of moths and butterflies, in the cursive coastlines of entire continents. Bacteria, everything. Put a single slice of any rock under the right light and it's all there, literally written in stone. More than humans are everywhere in texts for children, but they are usually objects of study, reduced to representations, and thus epistemologically erased. Why couldn't they be considered holders of knowledge? And I think Tales from the Inner City, uh, this book is trying to do that. What would happen if participatory research with children became participatory research with modern humans? And how can the fields of children's culture studies and modern uh, human participatory research enrich each other? I do not have definite uh, answers about how exactly this could be done. I have not yet engaged in more than human participatory research. I just had a brush with it, on which I'm going to comment later. Uh, but in what follows, I invite you to step back from familiar routines uh, in order to speculate, maybe even to fantasize about more than human research uh, in our work. What if you could do participatory design with children, texts and animals, or with a river, or with a forest? And I agree with Michelle Bastian that the very act of, as she says, putting ourselves in a position where we would be confronted with what it might mean to even try to include modern humans in participatory research processes may result in transforming the mainstream research. To do this speculation, I first discuss the challenges of modern human participatory research, then I comment on the notions of common worlds and childhood nature as helpful in conceptualizing uh, such research encounters. And I also refer to an example of research from early childhood education approximating this approach. 
And then I look at my own research with children to develop ideas for a more than human participatory uh, research in Kante. And I hope that this presentation opens further discussion about possibilities for such work. What might it mean once again to invite the more than human to be an active participant or even partner in research with children and texts? How are prevailing ways of conceiving our research? So knowledge production, ethics, uh, representation, dissemination and impact of research results challenged and transformed when we think of more than humans as co-creators of knowledge. Uh, what new forms of knowledge could emerge? Uh, the central issue for a participatory, participatory research is the ethics and politics of voice. Participation is about creating on hierarchical spaces uh, conducive to the emergence of until now rarely acknowledged or silenced voices. We can often read about giving voice to participants or about eliciting their voice. Regardless of whether we are talking about human voices or more than human voices, this idea of giving voice, so implying that participants have been voiceless before our intervention, is problematic. There is always a risk that we end up speaking for the participants or on their behalf, inadvertently coming to colonize them. As I have also learned in my uh, participatory work with children, we cannot escape such challenges as the unequal distribution of power in the research process, limitations in the representation of children's voices, the development of mutual trust, reciprocal respect and responsibility, the acknowledgement of intra-childhood diversity, and the situatedness, temporariness and contingency of knowledge production involving young participants. The intergenerational interactions in such projects are usually fluid uh, and adult researchers need to juggle the roles of a fraternal least adult figure or a facilitator and a supervising teacher. Child researchers, on their part, switch smoothly between the roles as supervised participants relying on adult assistance um, and uh, full-fledged uh, researchers. In more than human research, giving voice to participants inevitably entails anthropomorphization. Which does, not, which, which, does not, uh, which does not necessarily imply only an anthropocentric gesture of projecting human features on others uh, in order to dominate them. Nico Carpentier notes that when representing more than humans, humans, as he says, unavoidably find themselves in the position of being a steward and representative on behalf of nature, which can nevertheless be at least to some extent mitigated by, as he says, a non-hierarchical and respectful sense of responsibility and an ethics of care. Anthropomorphism has recently indeed been re-evaluated re for its potential to open human perception to multiple commonalities that cut, cut across human non-human divides and separatist ontologies, as Karen Mahon uh, puts it. And uh, it, it may help us reveal hitherto unnoticed activities and processes that we all have in common. And I couldn't help include, uh, but I needed to include a quotation from Olga Tokarczuk uh, from her Nobel Prize speech about uh, these connectivities. Uh, I think it's very, very telling, very moving what she says about them. And you can have a look at it later and maybe look up her, her speech on your own. Uh, Carla Frechero argues that, as she says, to forego any representation at all in order to avoid the traps of anthropomorphism is to relinquish responsibility for, in the sense of responding to, the core articulations of lives, histories, and cultures called human and animal, and of course, more broadly, uh, more than human. But this is not everything. Uh, Carpentier stresses that more than humans, uh, so living beings and uh, abiotic matter, have the capacity to generate signifying practices through their bodies and other forms of agency. Think of the soil trembling and moving. This is the idea that I have already signaled in the quotation from Chantaine, but let me at this point briefly refer to the concept of storied matter uh, proposed by Opperman and Iovino, which may facilitate um, our acknowledgement that humans are not the only storytellers and that there are a variety of ways through which stories can be told. Storied matter emphasizes the idea that matter is not only lively, agentic and generative as proposed in new materialism, but also uh, densely storied, as Opperman says, it's a material mesh of meanings, properties, and processes in which human and non-human players are interlocked in networks that produce undeniable signifying forces. Matters uh, stories emerge through humans, but at the same time, humans' agency, um, as Cohen puts it, 
emerges through material agencies uh, that leave their traces in lives and well as uh, in stories. So we can imagine these processes as, um, again to quote uh, Opperman, as the unfolding earthly story created out of multiple encounters of biomes, geological and microscopic realms, as well as cultural spaces and literature. As Opperman stresses, chemical substances circulating in the biosphere or plastic bags invading the oceans and choking marine life are as expressive as bacteria and more complex organisms such as plants, animals and humans. The story emerges, as she says, in the form of evolutionary, uh, evolutionary histories, climatic narratives, biological memories, geological records, species tragedies and DNA poetics. And as Opperman continues with so many storytellers and non-linguistic uh, performances around, we need to be attentive to their stories and their more than human meanings forged in, method, uh, in matter's storied dimension. Storied matter compels us to think beyond anthropocentricity and about um, our coexistence and co-evolution in the story of the earth itself. Opperman hopes that if storied matter becomes part of our storytelling culture, it can play an important role not only in our learning about the state of the planet, but also in finding solutions, um, to quote again, to our current problems and in creating post-anthropocentric discourses. Or maybe we could, we could flip it a little bit and say that our stories should be part of the Earth's storytelling. Uh, more than human participatory research may be a way towards this goal. If we try hard to mitigate the inescapable uh, anthropocentrism of our practices by learning to listen and respond to all the voices of adults, of children, and of more than humans with care and respect. We also need to recognize and accept the experience of being interrupted by non-human agencies that emerge from events, encounters, and relations among beings, objects, spaces, temporalities, and ethics. Now, we'll tell you a little bit about it later in my own research. Um, and of course, this includes also bodies and texts and these interruptions, I mean. And this in turn means noticing diverse modes of participation and expression that exceed those of human participants. In the projects I co-conducted with, with child researchers, uh, some of the participants were happy to work with surveys and focus groups. Uh, they were happy to visualize the data in graphs and co-write scholarly articles. But what about the bird song, a new growth in a forest, or the rustle of a stream and other voices of the earth, alongside a human story in a children's book? Standard human-centered qualitative methods may not suffice. We need to be open to experimentation and newness, if that is what the research with modern humans takes. Ultimately, um, I would say that it's about finding new ways of being uh, human. There is one more issue I would like to, maybe a richer ways of being human, in fact. But there's one more issue I would like to draw your attention to. Uh, we should not assume that participation is by default a good thing. We should keep asking ourselves uh, whether participants are happy to engage with us uh, and with each other, thereby checking our impulse to include. They should also always have the right to withdraw from the research without any negative consequences. This does not mean that they always understand everything that we want to convey. It's rather about the willingness to continue um, responsive engagements with us, uh, letting us approach them, accompanying us, or thriving because of our activities. In participatory research, we need, to, once again, what Didri Haddon refers to as uh, safe spaces, open, non-judgmental attitudes, and horizontal and democratic structures of communication. But ensuring all this in research with more than human actors certainly makes one acknowledge limits and boundaries of participation and perhaps consider a change in the meaning of participation as such. And I would like to refer now to two concepts that could help children's culture scholars and educators uh, to embrace and respond to kinships with modern humans in their work. One is the Common Worlds Framework, developed by the Common World Childhoods uh, Research Collective in response to calls by the environmental humanities scholars to rethink our place in the world and our relations with Earth others in the Anthropocene. So this um, notion uh, reconceptualizes inclusion as encompassing children's relations with all the others in the world, including modern human others. And this formation of new kinds of ethical relations with modern human, with the modern human, is to be achieved through exploring and supporting children's relation with place, with other species, and with the material world. And another such inspiring concept is childhood nature, proposed by Childhood Nature Collective, aimed at enabling a relational ontoepistemology that would create conditions for interconnectedness as the central focus of education. 
According to this approach, uh, children participate in a continuum of mutually shaping and multidirectional connectivities with nature that occur in socio socio-ecological contexts involving humans and other kinds of beings and agencies. In fact, children, just as adults, are nature because they always already belong to modern human ecologies or collectives, which in turn are intimately entangled with the planet. Childhood nature questions romantic associations of children and childhood with nature and rejects, as Karen Malone puts it, uh, adult sentimentality about children apparent timely loss of nature connections. As childhood nature can be attended to through various material, social and conceptual practices, uh, children's culture, which itself expresses, represents and produces relationships, is part of childhood nature relationalities that can shape our awareness of what it is to be in the world. As such, children's culture may help us to see ourselves as participating in complex ecologies we share with other entities. Now, interesting examples of interdiscipl interdisciplinary research bringing together the common world's framework and the concept of childhood nature can be found in the International Research Handbook uh, on Childhood Nature. And you can see the cover of, the, of this book here in the slide. Uh, let me mention briefly one such example, as I think uh, it's very close to modern human particip participatory research. It's a project uh, described by Tracy, Tracy Young and Jane Bowne in chapter, chapter 62, uh, Traveling Intersections of Childhood, Animals, Education, Narratives of Love, Life and Death. The authors explored and joined for some time, uh, as they say, uh, the everyday practices of animal and human bodies, which revealed imminent possibilities for child animal educational relational ecologies in early childhood education. Uh, the study took place at Cornish College, a small independent school in the southeastern region of Melbourne, Australia. And as they write, a rescue dog and resident of the school called Cosi, then a two year old border collie, helped to quote, um, to sniff out uh, border crossings and openings for these relationalities. Uh, the study also involved uh, a kindergarten group of children aged five and six, uh, teachers, four focused families, families who lived with pets and some classroom animals. And I want to focus on Cosi, whom the authors call a pet dog. Cosi's interactions with the children offer an example of how humans and canines learn together. And let me read a longer passage from the chapter. So Cosi lives uh, within the school grounds with Mr. D, who has worked and lived at the school for over 20 years. Um, this unique lift situation opens up bare border spaces in education settings where a dog is enabled a level of freedom and privilege that facilitates dog, child, stick, water entanglements. Cosi has always shared his life and schoolwork as a pedal dog with a human companion, and his photo at the top of the staff notice board is a testament to his position at the school. Cosi is privileged by the children who see him as a friend and playmate, and they relish in his energy and playfulness. He appears in the drawings and conversations with family members. Cosi shows the power of positive relations and brings the light to children, educators, and parents. Cosi is a being who responds and reacts. He's not trapped or contained uh, all of the time as the object of study. He's a free animal in action as he and the children go for walks together and explore the grounds around the school. For more details, uh, of course, I refer you to this chapter. It also contains uh, excellent theoretical background. But let me just say that we see here a possibility uh, for teaching and learning and possibly also researching about for and with more than human relation relationships. As I was not able to find anything on whether Cosi is still there at the school, actually this week I reached out to the offers and they confirmed uh, that he's still there at the school and he still walks with the children. And the question, this question uh, that I asked uh, about Cosi, I think it signals one of the challenges I mentioned earlier, the problematic temporalities of participatory research, different temporalities for uh, humans and for modern humans. And this is a very interesting issue, but it deserves, I think, another discussion on another occasion. Uh, to sum up, uh, Young and Bone argue for taking steps to reimagine relational ecologies of education by remaking ways of living together with ecological justice in both thought and action. And perhaps the same could occur in our work. Let me now move on to my own research, uh, to moments relevant to this discussion. 
In one of the projects I co-conducted with child researchers, the children decided to make a short film adaptation of the novel we read together to express their understandings of this text. Uh, it was the fantasy novel Anlandan by China Mieville. And while they kept the gist of the original narrative, they also added some new elements to the adaptation. And you can read about the project uh, in this article in the uh, that I mentioned in the slide um, and on the website. Uh, but there is one moment in the children's film and at the same time one event that took place during the filming that continues to haunt me and some of you might recall that I presented on this haunting in a bit different light at the IRSCL Congress in Santiago. Now in the film, uh, the main protagonist um, unexpectedly find, finds sunflower seeds in her lunchbox, uh, which later plans to save the fantastic world uh, from the villain, the smog, and this is something that the children added to the film, to the story. Um, and you can see in the film that to plant the seeds, the girl playing this character pulls out some other plants, looks at them with frustration, calls them weeds and throws them aside. Let me explain. The children shot the film spontaneously, rehearsing only selected bits and under the pressure of time. And as someone who appreciates engagements with um, the modern human world, I should have reacted to what the girl did. I witnessed it. I didn't because we were short of time, because the children moved on to the other parts of the film. And I know I failed ethically. As Emily Bossolet puts it, and I fully agree, as researchers, we are accountable to those human and non-human bodies with whom we are entangled, also in uneasy encounters, including death, but I failed. And I'm convinced now that, that as a team, we should have challenged ourselves to become open ontologically, epistemologically, and ethically to what that situation could have taught us if we had been attentive to the invitation of that event. We could have reflected on plants in general. After all, if plants are seen as lacking sentience, and so um, we, they are inferior to animals and humans, uh, then maybe their deaths uh, should not matter to us, even if they make human and animal life possible. And maybe we could have checked what plants exactly were pulled out. Um, maybe there were more of them in the schoolyard and those plants became weeds simply by being in the wrong place at the wrong time. We would then have asked ourselves why we preserve some lives around us in the, uh, and, and do violence to others at the same time. Perhaps we would have created our own stories about weeds or searched for children's narratives about weeds and talked about how they are represented. As Etchinson's head note, encounters with invasive species highlight the point that struggles for living and dying are mutual concerns, humans and plants alike. Invasive plants, their agency and mobility in particular, challenge our human-centric and even our animal-centric ideas, uh, as they write, what about, about what the body is and what it can do. And we could have addressed all that. Uh, however, I think that the weeds from the schoolyard could have inspired and in fact merited bolder methodological moves. Uh, perhaps we could have uh, invited um, uh, the other weeds uh, in the school uh, yard to join the project um, as participants and collaborators. Well, the very thought of plants as potential collaborators in research uh, boggles the mind, I know. Most people would assume that encounters with plants are one-sided. So plants do not speak, and as Hannah Pitt points out, to assume we know how a plant can benefit from co-production of research and knowledge is to reassert the humanist chauvinism, which modern human approaches seek to overturn. It may be indeed difficult to make a distinction between a human-centric concern with plants and their relations with people, and an interest in plants in themselves. And in the end, participatory research may always be more transformational uh, for the human researcher uh, than for more than human participants. As Pete asks, can we imagine from a more plant-centered perspective what plants might seek from participatory research? Well, if plants' life is ultimately about reproducing, then maybe we should make sure that the research process benefits them by enabling them to flourish. That is to have, um, quoting from Pitt, the freedom to live out their, their ways of being. That would also mean that we accept a way of being which does not include the will to co-produce knowledge in ways we would like it to happen. But perhaps more could be possible if we turn to the concept of storied matter, and in this vein also to phyto uh, semiotics, so the semiotics of plants, which is an inquiry into sign processes occurring within and between uh, species of plants. And there are also more and more studies, as you can see in the slide, these are just some examples, arguing for plant intelligence and memory that prove that plants are capable of storing and learning from memories of what happens to them. 
There are also studies of plants movement agency and problem solving, which occur without plants having self-consciousness and brain activity. This new sensory and extrasensory knowledge is a big epistemological challenge against anthropocentrism and cerebrocentrism. So this belief that intelligent behavior is not possible without the infinitely superior human brain. And I think it's also an opportunity for scholars and educators to foster in ourselves and together with children we work uh, with uh, new ethical sensibilities undoing human exceptionalism and creating new ecologies of knowledge. Coming back to the weeds. Now, I walk and Wayne trying to suggest participatory openings, and I'm sure the child researchers would have had many ideas about how to invite the plants from the schoolyard into our work with the book and film. And I think that we could have followed the other weeds at the school premises to see where and how they grow, maybe somewhere hospitable or maybe in the cracks in the concrete uh, where other plants cannot thrive. And then we could see what story they have to tell. For example, how they transform uh, the schoolyard, right? The concrete on the schoolyard. Um, and how, how resilient, how adaptable and diverse uh, they were without having too, uh, enough soil. And maybe the weeds we pulled out uh, would have regrown and then we would have observed how they lived on. And maybe we could have included them in the film and not the sunflowers or maybe with the sunflowers. Their strength and ability to appear in unexpected places and to thrive in uncongenial conditions would make them very likely to defeat the villain uh, without human intervention. So we could have explored uh, how they could do that. Maybe they and the sunflowers could have collaborated. And then through the emphasis on the plant's material agency, the film would tell the story not just of human agency and its power to save the world, but of interspecies solidarity, acknowledging the existence of the material voices and activity of plants. You would then have reflected on what uh, light our solution shed on the book. But how would the weeds in the schoolyard benefit? Maybe we could try to make the rest of the school aware of their existence and earmark a weed garden just for them and continue to follow them and their stories. So we see here that firstly, we need a movement away from traditional scholarship that focuses on individual expertise towards what can be done with others. And secondly, that these others do not need to be human to contribute to research, as long as we think of approaches attuned to their needs and experiences. And I will continue to speculate about such possibilities. I will try to continue to push at the limits of my own imagination as a scholar and that of our field. And hopefully one day I will get another chance at pursuing more than human participatory research. So by way of conclusion, um, let me just quote Monica Galliano, um, a hu human plant studies scholar who does comments on her transition to human plant studies. The main difference is that I used to live in a world of objects. And now I live in a world of subjects. And so I'm never alone. And none of us are. So why not accommodate our work to the sheer wonder of this insight? Uh, also, when while we are uh, being called on to bear witness to erasures of human and modern humans, um, of humans and modern humans uh, in Europe and elsewhere. Thank you. And I have some references to share as well. And I think I will stop sharing right now. Great. Um, thank you very much for this talk. For Thank you for pushing the limits once more, uh, for speculating, for bringing so much um, questions and provocations, I guess. So as I said uh, before, we are gathering. So there are two options to make questions. You might raise your hand and we give you access to the microphone. So then you can voice your question or you can decide to put it in the Q&A box. Um, and before people digest <laughs> and come up with the questions. I'm still digesting everything. So it's <laughs> more than human questions. Uh, I do have one that is like um, it's quite humanist my question i have to say but well anyway um we have to we have to get there first um so i wanted to come back to this poignant sentence that you that you voiced we should not assume that participation is by default a good thing that is something that i very much agree and, and I think I agree not only in terms of the benefits for those that participate, but also 
it might not always be good for research as well. I and mean, it all depends how do you frame it, right? Yeah. Um, so I wonder. I could comment a lot on that, how difficult it is and frustrating yeah. sometimes. Yes. OK, sorry. <laughs> That's what I want you to comment on, but with something else. So yes, uh, if it's if it's I would say, I don't know if you can go as far as saying that it might be complicit, like participation as a, as a research paradigm might be complicit to the reproduction of epistemic injustice, I would say, right? So epistemic injustice, understanding that certain people are wronged, so they cannot know uh, because of who they are or because of what sort of testimony they are giving, right? Um, so we do that with children, for instance, all the time, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so I wonder if participation is might even be complicit in the way that we, adult researchers, are the ones that are gonna decide when a child is the participant and what counts as participation in our research project. So that's actually one important part of the question, but then comes like a second addition. So, so like the post-human part of it. So how would this more than human participatory approach, then we might also be wronging, um, if you follow, uh, non-human subjects as well or actants, right? So how do we deal with that? And how does a post-humanist uh, or new materialist approach can help in some way to lessen at least this, this epistemic injustice in research? Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, long <laughs> comment and question. I'll try to maybe I'll untangle it a little bit. Uh, yes, I, I totally agree that participation is problematic, uh, that uh, the experiences that I have had, it's always my own initiative, uh, engaging, I mean, I, it, it was always myself and my colleague, uh, Mateusz Marecki, with whom I collaborated on most of my projects, that we invited the children. Um, but of course, then uh, the children had, um, uh, well, that they could decide, of course, still, the decisions were probably a little bit, let's say, dictated by what they thought the teacher would like to hear, what we would like to hear. So I do understand there are problems there, of course. Yes. Yeah. But then maybe in the course of the uh, of the collaboration, you can try to mitigate this a little bit. Um, now, what I did in the uh, in, in the project with weeds, <laughs> well, not exactly with weeds at the beginning, it was a, that I initiated the whole thing, but then I opened everything to the children. So I was like really reduced in terms of my influence and, and let's say power at some points, right? I mean, power and control, let's say, over the research process, right? I wasn't in control most of the time, actually. So I think there are ways, I wouldn't say that it's linear and I wouldn't say that it's clear cut, black and white. Maybe that's the beauty of it, that we always need to be, uh, we all, always need to be attentive to what is happening, right? And to indeed have, have it in our minds that there are all these dangers of, 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 um, over control, of, of controlling, of, um, uh, uh, yeah, doing, uh, maybe imposing, right, your own expectations and ideas and so on. So uh, I do understand. I do agree that participation is is a problem. I think with the what happened with the weeds was that the weeds themselves kind of, as I was saying, interrupted us, right? Because that this happened uh, out of the blue, right? That this that the girl uh, pulled them out, so they appeared in the whole process all of a sudden, right? They weren't. I mean, we didn't even think about you know the weeds at all. So. I think these interruptions also kind of explode participation. I mean, this kind of, um, um, let's say, idea that that um, uh, we can plan things, that um, we can progress, let's say, in research. Uh, I think it's very messy. <laughs> messy, maybe it's not the right word, but it's, um, I, I don't think you can ever get it like fully right, but then there are also some benefits, I would say in the challenges. I don't know if I make myself clear, but um, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> and then the post-human, uh, with more than humans and, and the, the, the post-human aspect. Um, yeah, I think, um, let me think a little bit. Um, again, uh, what happened with the weeds, um, 
we had certain assumptions about how, how we wanted to work with the book, with the film. Uh, and that was, of course, uh, kind of, we could say human centric uh, and in a way traditional, right? I mean, okay, making an adaptation of the film was all again, the binds, uh, again, again it was all about um, interpreting, representing things and so on. But then, uh, yeah, they interrupted us. And of course, we did them wrong, right? We killed them, basically. Um, uh, but I think maybe even the, even the, the kind of ethical reflection that followed, it was only for me, I, I admit, uh, not, not for the children, it happened for the children. I, and it was my fault entirely that it didn't happen. Um, um, maybe that's something, I mean, this, this thinking always uh, with uh, tenderness, uh, maybe love, um, attention uh, about all these other participants, other voices. I think maybe this can um, help us a little bit, right? Now thinking of, of, of um, uh, uh, ethics of care uh, um, about responsibility. So uh, the feminist, uh, let's mm. say, a new materialist feminist understanding, right, of care uh, uh, here. Uh, tenderness, I think it's a lovely world that actually Olga Tokarczuk uses, and, and I love it I, uh, because I think tenderness is again something um, in a way, uh, it's, it's something different than love. It's about attention, I think. Careful observation and attention um, without any hierarchy, without creating any categories, any hierarchies. I think maybe that's the way. Maybe this kind of effective. Um, uh, or stressing our effects, right? But but these particular effects, or thinking with them, or, or working with them, however you want to put it, maybe this is a way. Mm. Uh, I'm not saying that it's hundred <laughs> percent <laughs> effective, but maybe. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Think of how you know all this has haunted me. Like it's incredible. I think. Right? I mean, the weeds are always there in the background. So. That's the, the ethical uh, burden in a way that, that it's there. Very okay, sorry, I'm maybe not making sense, but I'm, I'm not to make sense, I think, here. <laughs> in fact, so I just know. open it's things up. But actually, ideas come. Uh, it's, it's very interesting because you were also saying like something like along this line during your talk that participation is about responding to the needs of, of those that come. You didn't say it like that, but it was sort of yeah. idea responding to the needs that of those that come into the research encounter probably or research mm -hmm. not even assemblage so there's something that, like an event that happens and then participation is more about that than about voicing or producing mm -hmm. knowledge differently yeah. I would say it's more about getting into this ethical relationship which makes a lot of sense with this haunting so the, the, yeah. the yeah. guilty haunting of the wits yeah. um so we have I'm just going to, there are two questions of very different uh, nature, but I'm, anyway, I'm going to put them together because we do not have much time and then you can decide uh, how to answer to them. One is a question that comes very often, but we still need to find ways to answer. Um, I mean, I, I think I have heard you before, but anyway, it's very important. It's when performing a speculating research, so speculative research, I think how to publish within the strict academic frameworks of research. So that's probably a big thing. And then this by, and that was an anonymous spectator, even if I'm saying that it's nice to have your names and that you can raise your hand, no one has done that yet. And then the, we have two questions by Karina Franco. Uh, one is that she wants the bibliography, so I make sure that she gets it. Um, and then she's, she's actually wondering how this is related with uh, ways in which we can work against uh, adult centrism. Uh, adult centrism. Yeah. Okay. Uh huh. Uh huh. Well, right, the first question, very, very briefly. Uh, now, I think you need to try, and there, there will be people. Well, th this has been my experience uh, that there are there are people out there in our field. Uh, that that uh, you know can take the risk with you, right, and publish uh, something that is somehow um, you know unconventional, or maybe that still hasn't happened. 
uh, but, but you are trying to, you know, create some kind of um, a new direction, uh, maybe for others to pursue, not necessarily for yourself. I think I think this is happening more and more in our field. I mean, uh, but definitely, I think uh, in uh, childhood studies, uh, I think there has been. I mean, if you have a look at this uh, uh, handbook of research on childhood nature, I'm probably not getting it right. It's a such fascinating read. It's a huge book. But you can see, I mean, the work there is just mind blowing. I do recommend it. Like there isn't much on literature. There is, there is a little bit. There is a bit on film as well. Uh, but all the projects with worms, for example, with trees, um, it's it's so inspiring. Right? It really, I think, lets us kind of think of what what else we could do, right, with literature besides just reading and talking about it, discussing it. This is all important, but I think it can lead elsewhere. Uh, so. I would I would take the risk uh, with speculation, uh, definitely, um, and then uh, oh gosh, the other question was okay, the, the adult centuries. Yeah, I think we addressed a little bit of that uh, before. That um, maybe there are moments in such work, uh, whether it's with children or whether it would be with with uh, more than humans, that would be more about um, anthropocentrism. There, that these moments need to occur. I don't think that we can like overthrow <laughs> our position, uh, redefine our position uh, uh, altogether. Uh, but once again, I think I believe in negotiation. I believe in maybe letting go a, a little bit, uh, then reassuming it again. Um, I think sometimes children. What I learned is that someone, ch someone, uh, sometimes children wants us to be uh, uh, adults. Uh, well, adults, let's put it this way, in a way, mm -hmm. uh, that they, they expect the authority, they expect guidance. Uh, so it's always a matter of, of, of responding, right, of being like a raider. I would say it's being like a raider all the time in such, in, in this kind of work. And then you, you need to respond ethically and you need to see, of course, what is feasible as well. Uh, uh, well, yeah, yeah. What is doable also in terms of, I said, mentioned frustration earlier, but what is also feasible time-wise, for example. And there are other adults involved, like parents as well, and teachers. And uh, I think adultism can come from there as well. So then, of course, it's your also a kind of challenge how to deal with this, because you need to co collaborate, right? And, and, and so how to put it all together. Yeah, but it's... <sighs> Well, I haven't done participatory research for some time, unfortunately, because of the pandemic, but um, I know of projects, of course, that have been uh, done uh, during the pandemic as well, despite the, the obstacles. It's happening, right? I mean, participation is happening. Um, so I certainly encourage trying. <laughs> Good. Yeah. So I have some comments and questions that I'm going to put them all together in a last mm -hmm. round of, of questions. So. Mm -hmm. um, here I go. Um, well, one is uh, that there's, I think, Paola Andrade that is mentioning, um, sorry if I'm wronging the, the, the person that said this, but well, that the, all this reminds you of Gabriela Mistral. Remember that we were uh, reading and wondering about how Gabriela Mistral um, perspective is so post-human. So that's just mm -hmm. a comment that it's, it, it, uh, remind her about the um, Gabriela Mistral poem in which she um, that's a poem to earth. Mm -hmm. Then the questions. Um, one question is about how by Carola Martinez, a Chilean uh, Argentinian um, in, that works in, in research and as a writer as well, as a writer mm -hmm. as well, uh, she wonders what is class and, and our material possibilities also uh, have to do with, with how is that we might be excluded or not. A class, right? Class. Class. Okay, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Then if you want to write it down, because I need to do yes. them all together, not to leave yes, anyone please. behind. And uh, also we cannot go more than 10 minutes now. So that's why mm -hmm. I'm just going to put them together. So class is one of the questions. How does class might play into this way of thinking? Um, another one by Lorena Leiva is about technology. So um, you work 
were mentioned nature, she wonders about how technology, yes. uh, if they are also part of this uh, material condition, um, non-human actors. Uh -huh. um, then Paola Andrade was wondering, uh, what do you think about children's literature with a feminist lens or feminist children's literature? And one last question was, uh, by Clara Tirado, she's wondering if you have any kind of suggestion or idea of how would we need to train um, early childhood educators with this, uh, with this in mind, so to so to foster this sort of connections. Uh -huh. So, as you know, yeah. very okay. different questions, but <laughs> you just answer in any way that they are comfortable to you. Okay. Yeah. Um, maybe technology is, is a very interesting question. Uh, now, um, I think technology, of course, was involved uh, in the Weeds project. I mean, the camera uh, uh, was, yeah. A representative, <laughs> and of course, uh, uh, I, I didn't really go into this at all before. Uh, but uh, that's of course something that, that is worth exploring, like the very uh, uh, um, the, the medium that the that the um, the children chose, and then how that intervened, right? And how the, the equipment also intervened, because and well, it did intervene because at one point. <laughs> The girl who was to bring a professional camera to the school, uh, she forgot it, and then we were unable to film, so we needed to, to postpone filming. Uh, but apart from that, uh, I think how the children played with uh, the focus, for example, um, with the sound and so on. So I think technology, uh, broadly speaking, uh, and it does appear in some of these publications that I mentioned, um, uh, that it may help us experiment it may help us uh for example i don't know record maybe some sounds uh or produce some images uh as um reflections of of the story of of, of of those stories of matter and other beings so i think technology could be a very um uh, could be a medium here could help here of course with us remembering right that indeed this comes from us and that we are um uh, uh, we are we are the users, but then of course, I guess we would also need to pay attention to how to to how uh, I don't know some technological equipment is agentic, right? It's uh, it's all this mm. talk you know about the apparatus, Barad, and I don't want to go into this. I don't I don't think I'm qualified enough actually, but um, uh, yeah, to think how our instruments, let's say, uh, uh, indeed. Um, uh, indeed, uh, affects right those research encounters. So this is a very, of course, interesting issue to to um, to explore, and also for me, which I haven't done, I must admit. Uh, now, class, uh, uh, of course, um, I often heard this. Maybe not not a kind of accusation, but indeed a kind of doubt. Um, okay, the children you worked with, um, you know, they they are kind of well-off children. Indeed, um, uh, they, the children I worked with, they loved reading, for example, right? So they came from, let's say, particular households, a type of households in which reading was somehow cherished, uh, uh, usually middle class. Uh, uh, and, and this is a challenge. Uh, um, indeed, uh, as I said to, to uh, actually in, 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 in the talk, um, how to, let's say, ensure this intra-childhood diversity. Right. Uh, I, I have no experience of working with other children. Right. It's just the children that um, whose parents were supportive, uh, the children who uh, wanted to work with us, um, uh, who um, who wanted to discuss things, who had no problems, no no material problems whatsoever. Right. Uh, so uh, I don't know if I'm addressing this question <laughs> the right way, but I, but I think. Uh, yeah, this is definitely a challenge in the class. Yeah, uh, it's, it's a big ethical uh, uh, challenge. I'm aware of, of that uh, very much. Um, oh, I had one in Kato. It wasn't really research. It was just a kind of workshop that we, uh, that with Mateusz, we, uh, that actually inspired a lot of our work. But these were the children that uh, we could see that they hated reading. Uh, they use mobiles all the time and, and they, the language they used so it was sometimes vulgar 
but it didn't mean that, uh, I mean, you could see uh, that they didn't really want to be there, right? At this, at this workshop about books, about reading, you know, during a, a book fair actually, right? They didn't want to be there, the teacher dragged them there probably. But, you know, at some point they did get engaged and, and some comments that they, that they made, they really made us think um, about our, our own expectations and our ideals. Um, our belief in book culture, so, and uh, and in the, the the importance of books, maybe not for everyone. <laughs> books are not that important for everyone as they are for us, and reading is not that important for us. Well, there are other kinds of reading, so all sorts of things like that. So, but I didn't have any further experience uh, with that. Uh, and educators. Um, uh, I think a lot, uh, well, I haven't worked with uh, um, early childhood educators. I can't comment on that. Uh, and I'm not in, in, in education as such. Uh, uh, but I do recommend uh, having a look at this Childhood Nature Handbook. Mm, uh, most of the, I think, uh, contributions there are related to education, also early childhood education. So lots of, I think, inspiration there um, to find. Um, uh, and. Um, I think, again, it's involving making them participants, I would say, right? Drawing them in, relying on the work, um, maybe yeah, making them researchers as well, together with you. Uh, and I'm not sure it's, it's really about training so much. Um, it's maybe, I mean, they have so much knowledge about uh, and knowledge of the particular, um, uh, the particular context, the particular schools, the particular groups of children. So I think it's us drawing on their experience and us um, as researchers uh, uh, relying on their on their expertise. Uh, so it works both ways. I mean, we can share some uh, some um, approaches, ideas with them, but then they share with us. And this is what we what we had experienced that we really learned a lot from the teacher that we worked with. Uh, so uh, kind of in more kind of pedagogical, let's say. Uh, dimensions. So I think it's it, a train is maybe not the word I would use, to be honest. <laughs> I have mm -hmm. some problems here. I would talk about exchange, mm -hmm. but I do recommend it, that the handbook for that. And feminist children's literature, um, I don't know how, I, well, I'm not, not sure what the question is about really. Um, I mean, there are good books and bad, bad books, I guess. <laughs> right? And, uh, but I, I I think I, I came to this uh, kind of conclusion some time ago that even if you have a bad book, but you read it together, either with other adults or with children, I mean, you can still work it out uh, and, and you can, uh, it can be quite useful. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, definitely we need it, yeah, like feminist children's literature, of course, and maybe new materialist feminist children's literature, but I know if it exists. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not yeah, yet. Yeah. Or maybe some, yeah, I'm sure there are some texts. I'm just not aware of them. Thank you for these questions. Yeah, we really need to close, but there's a question coming from Taiwan, and I feel that they are just at uh, Saturday in Taiwan at the moment, right? So um, I want to read it. Um, sure, please, please. Just very last question. So thank you for the wonderful speech. Um, could you please explain a bit more in depth Nikolaeva's concept of aetonormativity mm -hmm. and how might this concept be applied to children's literature research? Thank you very much for considering my questions. Best regards from Taiwan, Kate Pei Ying Wu. Well, this is actually uh, one of the central concepts in children's literature research. So I think whenever you, uh, well, in quite a lot of publications, you will encounter it. Um, and it's, um, uh, it's a way I think uh, Maria did a great job, wonderful job, like formulating um, uh, this, uh, all these, uh, let's say, um, power, like um, all these nuances. She put all these nuances of power, structures, uh, conflict, intergenerational conflict into this, this term. Because of course, yes, at least in Western societies, we, we, this is what our lives look like very much. <laughs> that indeed uh, uh, adults are controlling children in many ways. Uh, so, so this is one of the central concepts. Of course, it has a long story, a kind of history. It comes from Jacqueline Rose uh, and so on. So it's a culmination of certain thinking, I would say. 
uh, in, in um, uh, children's literature studies. Uh, and I think the whole fun right now of, of, of in our field is actually trying to somehow see if there are any other possibilities or how we as researchers, that's what has been fascinating me myself because I'm not denying that we live in heteronormative societies in, in the West at least. Uh, my family is probably heteronormative as well <laughs> to a large extent. But I think that the, the fun is how to, you know, if, if to see if there are any cracks, if, if there are any um, uh, any openings, right? Other possibilities uh, where where this kind of for, for a moment stops to be uh, the dominating paradigm. And I think Maria came to that conclusion as well <laughs> in one of the publications that uh, um, that that indeed um, uh, there 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 is a lot of let's say thinking otherwise right going on in our field and in literature as well, of course. But I do recommend, first of all, Maria's publications. Mm -hmm. It's a central concept to our field. Wonderful. So thank you very much again, Christina, for joining, for sharing. Thank for you. Thank you, Macarena, and, and all, yeah. all of you. Uh, and everyone connecting from everywhere, especially those on a Friday evening um, and those from far away. So there are some comments for you coming up on the chat if you want to, to see mm -hmm. some greetings. Thank you. This will be available. I'm going to switch to Spanish now, okay? Um, va a haber un registro de esta, tanto the, en inglés como en español. This talk will be in Spanish, in English and Spanish. That will be in the website of the uh, Educational Justice. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Justina, for connecting, and we will continue talking about this in, an, in other meetings. Always 12.30, but I think we're going to change to Thursday. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all.